for as soon as possible. <laughs> yeah. There's actually a button at the bottom that we, um, that we, that we can hit. Now, you, this, this issue is vitally important throughout this region because as we discussed the other day, there's actually a war against heritage in this region that's going on. And, and I know that there's, that there's the front line of that war has been here and in other places, the work that's been done in Petra, but, but um, there was a conference here in December that was focusing on this. Um, and, and perhaps you, we could start by talking a little bit about what the objective was of that conference. Do you want to start, Zaki? Well, this was a conference that was uh, sponsored by His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed, the Crown Prince of Abu Dhabi and the Deputy Supreme Commander of the Armed Forces, and by French President Francois Hollande. And it was in response to what was happening around us in the destruction and degradation of historic icons by the new barbarians uh, who were tearing apart the narrative we spoke about yesterday of man's civilization. And so it was decided that a major international effort should be mounted in order to face this together. As a result of that conference and the subsequent one that was held in Paris, a new fund was set up, Alif, and with, which was able to bring about $100 million in order to make it as seed capital foundation uh, to work towards the restoration of uh, historic sites, to the preservation of historic sites. More importantly, and as a result of that conference, more, or promoted by it, the Security Council resolution for the first time adopted a resolution by, that was co-sponsored by the United Arab Emirates, in which uh, for the first time there was uh, the globalization of the forms and provisions against the destruction of historic sites. The citation of this destruction as possible warm crimes. So as a result, I hope we will have now a concerted international effort, uh, work uh, been unanimous, unanimously supported by the world community to make an end to this constant degradation of man's civilization. Marriott. No, you can applaud. <laughs> you can applaud. By the way, you know, as good as Mohammed's story was, a couple of years ago when I was here and trying to learn about the UAE, people, somebody said to me, if you need the stories of the UAE, the real origin stories of the UAE, go to Zaki. He was there. And so if you see Zaki walking down the hall, stop him. Ask him for the stories. He's got all of the stories of, of the origin. But is this enough? Is, did the conference bring us far enough? What's, what are the next steps we need to do? The next steps, that's a great question to ask, David. And maybe thank I can you. take it. It's taken maybe, me a day and a half to get to a great just question. We're going to flatter you, right? Thank you. Um, <laughs> right. So let me take it up maybe 10 kilometers for a second and ask, why do we preserve cultural heritage? And the way I like to think about it, uh, as people have said here, the production of cultural heritage is something that human beings share. We do it in different ways, but what does it really mean to create cultural heritage? Well, when you think about what human beings, what we leave behind as individuals and as people, you can put it in two categories. There's the stuff that gets discarded, the trash, the detritus, and there are the things that we value and that we think should be kept, and you might say they are art. So we have art and we have trash. And those are the two things that people leave behind. Now, you could, when you think about that, you also know that one person's rubbish is another person's treasure. And so what different cultures believe is worth keeping and what counts as art, uh, and, and does count as art, and what, is, what really should be discarded and perhaps even destroyed, because to some people it might be an ab ab abomination. This is what really is all part of culture. And so when I say that, you can see that cultural heritage is not a neutral thing, and that for a fund like the one that we are very excited about to succeed, it can't just be a matter of expertise being dropped in and saying, now we are going to preserve your culture for you because this is so important. It seems really important to think about who the stakeholders are in a particular culture so that they can be brought in and help decide what should be kept and how and what perhaps might be let go. Well, Petra seems to me to be a great case study for this because 
I don't think there was ever any doubt in the mind of anyone um, that this is a, something to be preserved. Yes. This is, I mean, it's one of the most remarkable places I've ever been, right? And, and, and so the, the, we pick up on what Mariette was saying. In a case like that, do you still find a kind of a, a national consensus to go, invest, protect? Are there struggles? What are the challenges you face in a place like Petra? So I'll backtrack one more person as well. So the efforts of the UAE and UNESCO to lead um, on this resolution have been fantastic. But it's not just heritage and conflict that we need to worry about. It's heritage and crisis. And crisis can be this sinister daily destruction of sites that's not quite so visible and final as, as you see in other places. And so there is a lot of mismanagement. There is a lot of misuse. Um, there is a lack of understanding as to what site integrity actually means and how that translates on the ground into policies, standards, and guidelines of management, of development, of building. That's the threat that we face in Petra. It is not the conflict per se, but it's this crisis, sinister crisis of daily mismanagement that we sometimes see. It's not all the time, but we see it quite frequently in Petra. Um, and so I think the resolution is fantastic, but what is really missing are instruments, tools that we can use to ensure that non-adherence to these standards and guidelines and to the concept of site integrity, sustainable, responsible development are, are implemented. And back to, to your point about what it is that should be preserved or should, I think, wide, wide arena. Sites need to be preserved for their intrinsic value. They are beautiful, they are magnificent. It's hard to quantify. They take, you know, Petra takes my breath away every single time I, I go there. So there is intrinsic value. There is this link to the past, um, you know, the thread of common human history, shared human values that define who we are as people. Um, we heard that yesterday. There is a link to what they mean to us today. So how they relate to your identity, rooting national identities that distinguish um, who we are, authentic sense of who we are, into a past that is rooted in, in years of history, 10,000 years of history, opening up mindsets, opening up um, a sense of personal awareness that we are part of a larger community than the narrow communities that we sometimes um, define ourselves in. Um, that is, is sort of one antidote to extremist thinking. Um, and I think also you preserve them because the preservation of culture creates a safe space for people to express, to push the boundaries a little bit of, of um, how they express, to, to touch issues that might otherwise be sensitive, possibly taboo. Um, so I think that, and of course, there's the economic argument. So you preserve culture also because it makes financial sense. People in local communities have to benefit. Um, directly, whether it's through tourism, culture industries, craft, gastronomy, to make you happy. And <laughs> no, it's her. No, it's not me. It's, you know, she, I, uh, yeah, so I think in a nutshell, that's, that's um, where I think sort of some gaps exist and, and why it is important that, that we address them. Thank you. And thank you for referring to snacks as gastronomy, by the way. Um, Simon. Um, Simon. So we've, ta we've talked about a couple of wars going on here, right? There's, there's active physical attacks on these. There is sort of the war of neglect or the war of inattentive maintenance going on here. Uh, and, and what we're just hearing about is how do you develop the political will to actually prioritize these things, right. particularly when there's so many other priorities going on in a, in a crisis zone. And how is that challenge being tackled now? Well, actually, perhaps I should introduce uh, our organization, which is a specialized agency for the conservation of cultural heritage uh, that was created by UNESCO in 1956. It's called ICRAM, with the base in Rome. And uh, coming back to your question, I uh, would like to highlight the fact that, in fact, we started a program for the Arab region in 2004, where we, in fact, assessed the needs and the priorities. Of course, the priorities have changed from 19, uh, 2004 to the more recent few years, you know, uh, four years ago, where, you know, you have 
conflicts uh, in, in this part of the world and destruction and intentional destruction of cultural heritage. So we have been trying to address all these issues and I have also to refer to the fact that the UAE as a pioneering also country in this field hosted a regional office for this organization which is now based in Sharjah. And uh, of course we are an international body uh, working together with the government of the UAE to serve all, all the region to address the many issues that you have all referred to. Um, starting, you know, what we started a few years ago was more related to what issues was, um, you know, present at sites like Petra. And I actually worked in Petra for some, some time. And also we address basic questions uh, like why heritage? Because I think we, this is really much needed uh, in this particular part of the world to understand the essence of uh, the preservation of cultural heritage. And I think this is really important, but also we're, we've been doing with our partners in the UAE several activities related to the protection. Now, all the um, political aspects that were addressed and uh, you know, pioneered, let's say, by the UAE now would need some technical support. For example, when we talk about safe havens for this special funds, we need to look at technical issues of how we evacuate sites, how we, uh, we, um, we transport objects. And so this is really a, the essence of the work that we do um, as an intergovernmental body based here in the region. Thank would you. you. Would you allow me a narrative? Uh, could I stop you? <laughs> could I stop you? No, no, go on. Re re reacting to what both Marriott and to what uh, Princess Keep talking. I'm just Diana get said, a narrative about what happened in here in the United Arab Emirates. It was in 1962, uh, and that was incidentally the time when this island, Saadiyat Island, was a desert island. We used to come here in order to ski sometimes or have a picnic, but there was nothing on the island. And tomorrow is going to be the home center for a cultural uh, capital, a hub, universities and, and, and museums. In 1962, Sheikh Zayed, the humanitarian and unique leader that Muhammad spoke to you about earlier, saw a heap of ruins out near Al Ain, and he thought it was, they were very important. This was pre-oil, but nevertheless, there was a priority in order to preserve a heritage. And so he invited uh, archaeological teams from Denmark. They had just uncovered the civilization of Dilmon in Bahrain and asked them to excavate that site in Al Ain. Now, as a result of that excavation, we had some beautiful bronze art, rock art uncovered. Uh, the panel of one of my favorite panels uh, are two human figures tenderly holding each other's hand, huddled between two oryx. Uh, and a copy of that was, is in a museum that Sheikh Zayed had built in 1969, before even we had the time in order to establish the network of roads and airports and infrastructures and that stands there today in order to tell us a story. Now the story was the narrative you spoke about, Dave, yesterday. This is a civilization that lived here 5,000 years ago, was connected across this area to Soma, to Babylon, to the Indus civilization, and it is now preserved for us. It tells us a human story. It is, this is the reason why there isn't a rubbish, any kind of heap of stones, as Sheikh Zayed's prescient vision for so could be a source of heritage for the country. And priorities, culture, as yesterday also the director of UNESCO was saying, is a major driver of durable development. So it is a major uh, driver and not a peripheral uh, force. We must work on the preservation of our cultural assets. Okay, that's a very interesting uh, story, and it's yeah, it's 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 certainly worthy of acknowledgement. I you know I I, I do want to open up these conversations a little bit more. One of the comments I got yesterday from people is the sessions are a little short. They are again. The idea was appetizers and to keep the pace moving, um, but. Uh, in each one of them during the last 10 minutes or so, and during a couple of other breaks that we've got, um, I, uh, uh, I'll look out. And if you want to say something, just wave your hand, you know, and I'll, I'll walk over at the appropriate moment when I, when I see it. I'm going to ask one or two more questions before, we, before I do that. We've got about 12 minutes left here in this session. Um, 
we've talked about what's working, we've talked about progress, we've talked about a couple of, of the challenges. I'd like to talk a little bit about the gaps and a little bit about how technology is going to change all of this. I, I've read some interesting things about 3D printing and, and, and that the, we've got the ability really to go out now and to store um, some of these sites at, digitally and have then using those technologies the opportunity to rebuild, reconstruct, maintain, actually create a kind of, uh, you know, there's this thing, this uh, seed bank that they have where they save all the seeds of the world in a big vault someplace in case there was a catastrophe. And it seems to me like you could almost do that with cultural heritage, is that right? Yes, I think technology has been an utter game changer for these potentials uh, of preserving cultural heritage in the way that can take into account what everybody cares about. And in the following ways you can think about it, the most important steps to guarantee the possibility of cultural heritage preservation in the first place is documentation mm -hmm. and of sites, of objects, of uh, intangible traditions, rituals, performance, and so forth. And then once you've captured that, and you can do that digitally, and you store it, then to educate about it and to engage people in that cultural heritage so they can have, have input. So what we've seen, for example, in Palmyra, the most dramatic case of, of wanton destruction and targeted destruction, is that with drone technology, this French company, Econim, was able to, to capture very quickly, very detailed areas both of that hadn't been destroyed yet, but also document damage so that in future, rebuilding could happen with some of that kind of 3D imaging that you uh, reference and that in, in fact could lead to 3D rebuilding as well. And then of course, I'm very interested in the possibilities of mobile technology, short range mobile mm. technology, as well as the web to make, uh, make people aware of what's in these sites to combat situations of looting, for example. If you know that something exists somewhere and you see it show up at a border patrol on your mobile, you can intercept it. Well, you could even go it's further, so right? As we enter in the big data economy, we're a few years away from a moment where there'll be 50 billion devices on the web. Most of those devices are part of the Internet of Things. Most yeah. of those devices are sensors. Yeah. And one could imagine web, uh, you know, uh, uh, heritage sites that had many, many sensors that would be able to maintain temperature, be able to maintain humidity, be able to maintain uh, uh, an eye on them, and, and so forth. Is that something you've envisioned as you approach uh, the maintenance of Petra? Definitely. I think the use of technology is the way of the future. There is, I mean, I agree with you completely. There is no other way to do it. Um, it and what most interests us at the Petra National Trust is not only the documentation, but it's the, your, your second pillar, the education. So we have really focused on, somebody asked yesterday, actually, who should be leading this um, movement, uh, this global movement, and it, it should come from the artists, it should come from the grassroots. And so it's local communities who are going to lead the protection and preservation of their sites. But you've got to do it based on facts and based on awareness, and it's the education and the awareness component, I think, that is critical. You cannot do education and awareness without technology these days. It won't happen. Children don't respond. Um, access is not, is not available. You will have to do it and talk. We, for the last five years, that's what we've done. We've gone into public schools in the Petra region, and we have you filled the gaps. There, there is hardly any culture, any art being offered to students in public schools um, in, in the south of Jordan. Um, and the form of education, the teaching, is, is a little bit antiquated based on rote learning. So we've come in to change both these things, to introduce technology, introduce med modern methodologies of learning, and speak about a systematic, comprehensive, cultural education program for children from age seven all the way through to, to age 18 and teacher training. So this has had the most profound impact on um, awareness, on the relationship between the individual and the site, on the importance of preservation, and then on behaviors, on civic behaviors. How do you behave in these sites? Um, what, don't chip a rock off to sell to a tourist. Don't I mean, uh, you know, have a sense of responsibility towards the site and, and um, towards your own community. Uh, and then you can introduce all sorts of other things through these 
things like gender equality and the role of women in, in all of this can be introduced through that as well. So I'm a huge believer in the technology. We've utilized it enormously. And we have seen from our on the ground experience that it has had an incredible impact on behavior and on awareness. Okay, so we've only got a few minutes left. That, well, thank you, go on. Um, we've only got a few, a few minutes left here and if somebody has, has a question, does somebody have a question? Uh, um, all right, we'll go all the way up to the back here. Let's keep the questions fairly short um, and the answers fairly short and let me ask that anybody who asks the question identify themselves, okay? Good morning, I am Nieves Tapia from Argentina. I was interested uh, if you were talking about the relationship with schools. Uh, we have plenty of experiences of students being not only recipients of education, but also partners and active assets for preservation. In Italy, they have adopted monument. In Latin America, we have very, lots of schools doing that. And I wonder if you have other experience in the region about student involvement. Let me ask you a quick add on to that question. And then, Simon, you can do the next one. But um, let me ask you a quick add on to that question. And that is, I've been thinking here, this is all about new collaborations. And we were talking about artist-led collaborations. And you know, you have students adopt a monument. I wonder if one could imagine local artists or others bringing attention, using their power and so forth, and creating new kinds of partnerships between artists and the heritage. So you have the future of the arts and the, the precious past somehow working together. Is that possible also? Yeah, absolutely. We have had actually recently, in the last six months or so, we have had two experiences of this. We've had um, visual artists and painters come together and, and document and reinterpret certain aspects of the heritage of Petra. And they've held workshops with students in the Petra region, where the students also painted and presented their understanding, their interpretation of their culture and if they're, of their heritage. And we held a fundraiser, so we sold these works at a fundraiser with the artists' presence and the, some of the students were present as well. So it really created a buzz within the arts community. Then we took this experience and did it with sculpture. Now sculpture in the Arab world can be a little bit tricky because it, in, especially in Petra, the, the monuments in Petra are, are in the minds of some very connected to sort of the idol worship, the pre-Islamic era. So we had to um, a little bit go beyond that to say that they are actually just forms of, of documentation forms of expression, um, and, and um, because they're, they're so physical, sculpture is so physical, it's a form of, of also creating beauty and, and engaging these young students in, in these things. So it was widely accepted in a very conservative environment. The artists went down, the very famous Jordanian artists, and worked with the students in their communities on creating interpretations of culture, interpretations of heritage, which we again sold uh, um, for um, the benefit of cultural education programs. So you do have, for, for us basically, so you do have and, that. And uh, I, we, we've, got, yeah. we've got just four minutes and one more question. But so very can brief. I encourage all participants then to go down to Studio 420 in, near the MENA where we have right now an exhibition called Less We Forget which brought about all artists, both indigenous mm. and, and local and, and expatriate, and with students in order to talk about heritage and its importance and in order to link it to the arts. And they will start today also a gallery experience. I encourage all participants to go out there in the mm. afternoon or tomorrow. And I, and I think there's a big, just I, I, one second, I think there is a big important theme here which is a theme that is coming out throughout this conference. The cultural community in the world is too fragmented. The artists don't talk to the arts administrators, don't talk to the policy people, the people in visual arts don't talk to the people in performing arts. And as a result of the fragmentation, everybody is weaker. If everybody is working together, you end up with more power and the ability to say that, you know, to, to gain traction. If the artist of tomorrow is helping to underscore the importance of the culture of the past, um, all of a sudden that builds a bond. And, and it, of course, it makes a lot of sense. Very, very briefly. No, I just wanted to emphasize the importance of education, especially at school level. But also, I mean, the end result, of course, is to address the, the students, but also the teachers. We, in fact, we started in uh, 2003 a workshop in Petra. Mm -hmm. 
and we try to uh, also have teachers with the students coming to see how the teacher would have also the technical abilities to introduce heritage into the school uh, activities, curricular or extracurricular activities at school. So I think this is really important. Okay, and again, what we're getting here is a sense of different kinds of coalitions, students, teachers, governments, artists, you know, local businesses and so forth. And you can't do it without the new technology, appreciation for the old. Very quick question. The, the, the question I have, sorry, my name is Simon Majumda. Uh, the question is, we've you talked about new technology a lot, and I know we've talked about that in Petra, but I'm wondering about crafts and reteaching disciplines yes. like stonemasonry. I know on visits to Petra, there's a college there, and cataloging those and how you feel about that importance in keeping our heritage. Go ahead, Marriott. And this is going to be the last comment here because we're going to go straight into the next panel. Simon, I think it's a great point that you've made. And it is one of these changes where we see that community has become so important beyond the technical expertise that's handed down through mm. education. The most inspiring example I discussed this morning with Ahmad Sarmast, who's here from Afghanistan. And it is a project in a neighborhood of Kabul called Turquoise Mountain which was destroyed through neglect, through actual warfare, through actual various acts of terror. And over many years, the last 10 years, a school has been created there for the recreation of these old crafts of mud brick architecture mm -hmm. in the original style. People really have been given jobs to learn to do this work. Hundreds of people have been employed who were underemployed before to rebuild this neighborhood. And along with it, reintroduce weaving crafts, pottery crafts, music traditions, and so forth. So I think that is just one example of an extremely successful effort to integrate craft with these more technical areas of expertise. And of course that also... And education. And it also creates economic opportunities. Yeah. Because yeah. as you develop exactly. crafts, you also develop markets and, um, and, and, and so and forth. a sense of pride as well, and, a sense of yes. real sense of pride. Right, and we were speaking yes, at, at dinner last night of a city in China that is almost, you know, I, I, gets 80 million visitors a year because of its crafts, right? Yeah. And so this becomes self-supporting uh, self across many ways. A great way to start the day. Ladies and gentlemen, join me in thanking this terrific panel.